You're listening to episode 36 of the Create If Writing podcast. I can't go back to sleep, it's almost light. These restless thoughts have kept me up again. Hello and welcome to the Create If Writing podcast. I'm your host, Kirsten Oliphant, and this podcast is for you if you're a writer, a blogger, or a creative who wants to build authentic platform without feeling smarmy. That's kind of a fun way to say that. So welcome to the show. I'm Kirsten. I'm excited to have you listening today, and I hope you're excited that we are talking with Madeline Sklar. And I say we because you're listening. I'm talking with her. But (laughs) Madeline is a Twitter expert, the host of the Twitter Smarter podcast, and also the host for the Twitter Smarter Twitter chat, which is on Thursdays. That's a lot of Twitters in one sentence. So clearly, Madeline has a lot to say. And we're going to talk about LinkedIn today. Just kidding. (laughs) Did I get you? Probably not. So we're talking about Twitter today. We're talking Twitter best practices, what you can expect from Twitter, how she got started being an influencer, and what are some of her favorite tools to make Twitter manageable? All great things to know. Before we dive in, and this is going to be a super short intro, I want to tell you about one or two things. The first is one of the reasons I'm keeping this short, which is I am hard at work on the foundation series. Now, normally every month I do a few live trainings where I set up a Google Hangout and a whole webinar page and do, I don't like to call it a webinar because I'm usually not selling something. And I think we all assume the webinars are about selling things, which is fine. But I think of it more as a workshop. And when I was asking last month what you guys wanted to learn, if you're on my email list, I heard images, blog, email, those were sort of the three things I threw out there. And everybody wanted to kind of, well, I guess not everybody wanted to know everything, but it was pretty split. So I decided to do kind of a series and I'm calling it the foundation series. And so we're looking first at your blog and then at your email list and then at images. Now, if this sounds really basic to you and the word foundation does sound very basic. This is not sort of a just getting started kind of thing, although this would be great if you're just getting started. But the foundation series is all about making sure you have one cohesive and intentional foundation for your whole platform. And so that includes your blog. And, you know, I, I planned the training for this today and I got so into it and so excited. And I hope it is not four hours long, <laughs> but it's going to be looking at even little things that you may not think about, like how many items should be in your navigation bar. Do you have one or two navigation bars? Do you have a sidebar, not a sidebar? All of these little details and types of things going back to your why. So we're going to do that on your blog this week, which is going to be Wednesday, March 9th at 8 p.m. Central Time, Wednesday, March 16th at 8 p.m. Central Time, and Tuesday, just to throw you guys off, March 22nd at 8 p.m. Central Time. And you can sign up for this at createifwriting.com slash foundation series. Again, that's createifwriting.com slash foundation series. So even if you can't make it live, because live things are really hard to make for everybody, you will get a replay. And I probably am going to charge for this later because once I dived in, this is a lot of kind of detailed content. So it is going to be free for those of you who sign up. You will get a free replay, but it may be a limited time replay where you can pay. It's not going to be, you know, as much as a course or anything, but probably somewhere around 50 bucks or under for a lifetime access to it, plus the workbook that I'm going to create. It's really going to be pretty epic. So don't miss it. Createifwriting.com slash foundation series. Get it now while it's free. You'll get the replays even if you don't make it live. The other thing is I want to introduce Madeline to you. And Madeline is, I believe, number three as of 2015. I don't know if there's been a 2016 list yet, but number three in Houston for social media influencers. And Houston is a huge city. I think we are moving into the number three spot in the US. So that's a lot of people. That's a lot of potential social media influencers. In fact, it's my goal to get on that list. I want to be on the list. So Madeline has been working on Twitter for years and actually is kind of a pioneer. And she talks a lot about her journey, so I'm not going to cover that. But she has been 
really effective in Twitter, has really great strategy, is a Twitter coach, has Twitter courses, and overall has helped so many people to do better with their Twitter and to find the ways to make Twitter accessible. And as you guys know, if you've read some of my posts about Twitter, I had to be won over. I was not a big Twitter fan at first. I joined, it was kind of like, ugh, what is this? Why do I have to be on this? And I just didn't use it. And then when I started using it, it felt like going into a room and just kind of shouting and nobody turned around to look at you. And that's not what Twitter is, but it takes a little while, kind of like most social media, to kind of get your feet wet, to try to figure out what the culture of this platform is like. So Madeline is going to give us some tips for mastering Twitter starting with some really actionable things. And we want to know what you want to apply. So we'll get back to that at the end. But here is my interview with Twitter expert, Madeline Sklar. Well, on today's episode of Create If Writing, I have Madeline Sklar, who is a Twitter strategist and just all around awesome social media person. And she lives here in Houston, which is fantastic because I actually got to meet her in person recently, which I don't often get to do with my social media people. So welcome to the show, Madeline. How are you doing? I'm great. Thank you so much for having me on your show. It's always awesome hanging around and chatting with our local Houston people because we've got a great community here. We really do. I was really excited. We got to meet at the Houston Social Media Breakfast, and it's just like this room filled with just really awesome people. So it's a lot of fun to get to go to that and to have people local who are doing really good things. So, Yeah, I agree. We got a great community here. There's so many just fabulous people that are so smart, and it's always nice to come together and hang out and meet in person. I love it. Yeah, and it's fun to be in the same city and still be talking right now for <laughs> Skype about this. <laughs> I interview. know, isn't that great? Yeah, it's really fun. Well, I want to get started kind of asking how you got to be where you are, because I saw that you were number three, or is it number two? I read a couple different things where you're very high up there, number three or number two in, the, in Houston for social media. So uh, how does one become, you know, super important and high ranking on the scale of Twitter and social media? You have a ton of Twitter followers also. So tell me a little bit about your journey and how you got here. Okay. Well, you know, to answer your question about, you know, becoming number two or number three or what any number is hard work. It's being consistent with working on your social media. I was actually surprised the first time that report came out. And the first time around, I was number two. The reason why is that Eric Tung who put it together, decided not to include himself. Had he included himself, he would have been number one. And that would have pushed me to number three. So what happened in the second year, it, you know, all of us urged him to include himself. So second time around, he, he included himself and I ranked as number three. And so it stands for these last several years. And I'm totally good with that. I like that I'm ranked high in Houston. I had no idea. I knew I was high in the music business, which I had been in for the last 20 years. I did a pivot last year. So I'll talk a little bit about my journey and how I did the pivot last year that got me to where I am today, which is in a really cool place. So we'll back up 20 years ago and I was in a totally different industry. I was in the financial consulting industry, which is like really hard to imagine me doing. Um, I, I It's hard for me to like imagine me doing that, but <laughs> it was a totally different industry. And I got to a point where I just didn't want to do it anymore. It wasn't fulfilling. And so I was learning some very basic HTML. I had gotten exposed to the internet and this was back in 1995. So at that time, most people did not even know what a dot com was. It was a very early stage beginnings for what we know in the public as the internet. And so I decided to start my own web design company. So I was one of the first people here in Houston. There were three of us that were like the first true web designers. And it was a wow. very cool time. Yeah, it was a lot of fun. So every time somebody called me and and it was local back then and I would go and meet with people, it was like 100% sale every time. Like I, I never lost a sale because I knew more than anybody else on how to do this. It was just a brand new industry at the time. And so I did that for 11 years. It was a lot of fun. So what I did at the same time is I launched and it was like a hobby thing. I launched a music community. I thought, I'm going to use the internet because I, I saw what the potential was with this. So I thought, why don't I start a community of female musicians 
and use this new internet thing that we didn't even know what we could do with it yet. But why don't I use it to basically cast a wide net and reel in all the different female musicians that I could find all over the world. And it was amazing. And there's so many people that I connected with. But back then, I launched it January 1996. Back then, there there wasn't an easy way to do this. So basically, it was a, a static web page with, you know, hey, email me your story. And then I would take their story and post it on my website. So there wasn't a lot of interactivity. But then we fast forward over the years. And then you had Yahoo groups, which was phenomenal. And that really elevated my music community to a whole new level. And so over the years, this was like building me up as the leader of the tribe of these female musicians. And so I became very well known in the music business with the independent musicians as the community builder, the online marketing uh, specialist, um, all these cool things. So I started going to music conferences and I was asked to speak on panels and do workshops. And so I was building this, this speaking gig thing that, I mean, at the time, honestly, I didn't even really know what I was doing. I mean, I, I had my web design business. I knew what I was doing with that, but building this whole other thing, it was just coming together. Like it was just, as I was treading along I was basically building myself up to where I am today as a paid speaker at conferences, speaking and teaching social media and specifically Twitter. And so the way that all happened was, um, you know, when, when social media really got going with the, with the MySpace days, um, and we're talking, gosh, that was like 11 years ago. I was the person everybody looked to for training. And so I was teaching people, people were hiring me to help them with their MySpace. And so it was like a little side business I was doing. And over time, I was asked to speak at conferences and events and talk about social media. And then as I was at these events, I was always asking people, because I'm very inquisitive, I would ask people, what are your favorite social media platforms. Why do you like this one? Why don't you like it? And what I was finding is that people did not like Twitter. And it, and it, and the reason why I discovered is because they didn't understand it. They didn't get it. They didn't understand why would you use this when you can only do 140 characters? And the other thing was, oh, isn't that the one where you post what you had for breakfast? I really don't want to be on that site. That sounds stupid. You know, that those were the comments I used to get. And I thought, well, why don't I just get myself on a mission to educate people? And so that's what I started doing about three years ago. I decided that I'm going to be on a mission and I came up with calling it Twitter Smarter. So I use the hashtag Twitter Smarter and I started developing online training courses. And then also what I did is I started posting on Twitter every day, multiple times a day, articles and information that I come across. So if I see an article about Twitter that I think people could benefit from, then I post it with the hashtag Twitter Smarter. So I tell people, go to that hashtag on Twitter and you'll learn things every day. So it really turned into this big thing. And so here we are now in 2016 and people see me as one of the leading experts in Twitter marketing. And I love that. So I'm in a really good place right now. I love teaching and I love helping people. Well, you're certainly really great at it. I mean, I know this just from interacting online with you and actually talking to you in person and reading your blog, listening to your podcast. And I love the Twitter Smarter Twitter chat, which is Thursdays, is it 12 Central Time and 1 p.m. Eastern? Am I right on the time? That's, that's correct, yes. Okay, on Thursdays. And so that's been a lot of fun is, is diving into there, and I've met some great people. Now, I have a really quick side question. Do you still do MySpace trainings? Will you train me on MySpace? <laughs> you know, I don't think MySpace is even around anymore. No, I, they are. I keep getting emails from them. Yeah, they're oh. like, here's what's new. I'm like, there's something new on MySpace? Maybe I should go see, you know. But um, anyway, just funny. a joke. They changed so much over the years. I can tell you this. Back in its prime, and this was before they got bought out by that big um, media corporate giant. I, I, I forgot the name of them. Um they were the most amazing platform for musicians to get discovered. So that that was like huge. That was like a, a big um, 
learning step we all had with social media back then. You know, back then a lot of people really weren't on social media because MySpace, a lot of people really didn't care for it and weren't on it. The people that gravitated to it were musicians and music fans. Those were like the two biggest groups that were on there. And I was able to help musicians get discovered. I know musicians that got record deals by by using MySpace and following my teachings that, that I did back then. Uh, it was an amazing time. And then when it went away and it was no longer a place to get discovered, we took, or at least I did, I took all those lessons I learned and I looked at how can I use this to help musicians now because times have changed. So I'm always looking at what can I do to help people right now benefit from social media. And you know, right now the big thing is Snapchat. And so I'm on Snapchat. I don't really care for it. I'm trying to figure (laughs) out, figure out how can I make it work for my clients and for other people in business that are trying to wade through all the different platforms and find what works for them. Well, and I think that's the real difficult thing. And, you know, I joined MySpace in, let me see, 2005. And uh, you know, I was in graduate school and I was, I think I was 27. So I was one of the older people in my graduate school class, which is funny now that I'm 38. But, uh, you know, the other kids in my class, they were like 22 and just out and they're like, we're going to go out, you know, we'll talk to you about it on MySpace. And I was like, why don't we just text? And they're like, no, 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 it's on MySpace. All right. (laughs) So uh, that's when I was on there. And I did, I found, you know, it was funny because there were a lot of musicians I connect with. I definitely can see how that worked. And it was an awesome place, you know, while it was there. And I'm not really sure what happened to to MySpace, but that's a whole other conversation for another day. But yes, it is. (laughs) um, I'd really be interested to like read a book on what what the heck happened? How did it go from being so amazing to like, no one is there. But anyway, back to Twitter, because that's um, your expertise. Although I I love the idea of taking all these lessons from different platforms, because, you know, it isn't enough these days just to know one platform. You can excel in one platform, but it's kind of like you sort of need to feel them all out. And, and, you know, I say that to people who are trying to build a writing platform or any other kind, you know, try some of them, see what works for you, find where your people are, and then figure out how to use that really well. And so I think that you do that on a lot of platforms, but you really excel about Twitter. So how did it become sort of your number one? Like, what is it that you love about Twitter that keeps you there? Well, what I love about it is that it's so concise. You know, when you're on there, you have to really be to the point with your message um, because you don't have the ability to do a long form post like we have on Facebook or Instagram. I love that. I like that a lot. Now, you know, there's these rumors that it might go to 10K. So could you imagine, you know, a tweet with 10,000 uh, no. character spaces? You know, that's a whole other subject. You know, that could be <laughs> a whole episode. It. Yes, it could. I know, absolutely. I know. I'm really um, disappointed that they want to go down this road. And, and you know, we just had on my Twitter Smarter chat last week, we had the discussion about it. And I get it. You know, it's, it's still going to be the 140 and then you click to, to read more more. But, you know, that I just really hope that doesn't happen because that could really change the entire landscape of how we're using Twitter. But I I chose Twitter because it's just to me, it's cool and it's fun. And and, you know, I say this and a lot of my colleagues say this. Twitter is the cocktail party. You know, Mm. it's like a great place to network and Twitter chats are a phenomenal way to do it. You know, I've been hosting mine, uh, which is just for business owners and a lot of social media marketers come on. Uh, my Twitter chat is for anybody that wants to learn Twitter tips and you come in there and it's just this, it's, you feel like you're in a room full of cool people. And you can just go from person to person and have these little side conversations. That's what I love about Twitter chats. You know, you can just have side conversations during the chat for everyone to see. And it's a great way to, you know, just find a few people to just have these amazing conversations with and then take it outside of the chat later. And I've done that with so many people, a lot of people that you and I both know. I mean, we have a lot of mutual friends that I met through having conversations with them during a Twitter chat. And I think, you know, people join Twitter, and I was like this as well. And and you mentioned that some of your clients were that when you join Twitter at first, it, it can seem a little weird and overwhelming and the stream just moves. And 
you know, I wrote a whole post about how Twitter, sometimes people get on, they feel like it's just shouting into a crowd and nobody turns and looks and, and says anything. And I think, you know, when you join Twitter, that's sort of the temptation is just to go on there and start posting stuff, which you should do. But you kind of wait for like the validation of a Facebook like, because people like everything you do on Facebook, <laughs> you know, like, right. you can't post anything, at least your profile and not get a like, there's always interaction. And so on Twitter, it's a different kind of interaction. So people think no one's interacting because nobody favorited or, you know, whatever to my post, but it takes some time to kind of find the way that people talk on Twitter. And I think your the cocktail party analogy is perfect. And it really is like that. But it does take a little bit like you need somebody, you know, like you to help people kind of get in and kind of get their feet wet. And then once you do, and you kind of understand how Twitter works, I love it too. And it was definitely not my favorite platform to begin with. And now I, I don't know that it's, I mean, it might be my favorite. It's definitely where I spend the most time other than Facebook in terms of communication, but it's a different kind of th- communication I'm doing. I mean, it's more, that's more with my friends. And I feel like for me, Twitter is where I connect with all the people kind of in my industry and my niche and I meet new people and learn things. And so it's, I really, I agree with all the things you said. I think it's a really neat platform, but, but it can be a little weird to kind of break in. So what do you, what would you recommend, you know, in terms of best practices for people? Like what, how can people kind of get started? Or if they're on Twitter and they've been there forever and they're like, it's just not working for me. What are some of the things that you would recommend to those people? Well, here's what I always recommend for for everybody that I work with is to first start, you got to first go back to the basics and let's look at your profile. What can you do to make your profile outstanding? What can you do to make it compelling? Because what happens is whatever you're doing, you're posting, you're going to a Twitter chat, you're, you're, you know, retweeting and replying to an industry leader, whatever it is you're doing, it's going to direct people to your profile. And if your profile sucks, they're, they're, you've <laughs> lost them, you know? I mean, I hate to sound harsh, but it's so true. So you got to first look at the profile picture. Have an awesome headshot. Have a great picture that just says who you are just by looking at it. You know, a picture is definitely worth a thousand words on Twitter because you've also got the big header image. And your big head, I, I, time and time again, I see people not doing it right or at least not utilizing what they can do. We've all got this, this big space that's basically real estate for your business. You can put whatever you want on there. There's no restrictions. You know, Facebook has restrictions with this. You can't have your .com or a phone number embedded as text. You can't have um, too much text. You know, it's like this whole percentage thing. They're very strict. But with Twitter, we can do anything we want. So I'm always telling clients and people I work with or people that come on to my chats or my courses, Utilize this space and, you know, use it to really show off your personal brand or if it's for your company, whatever it is, you know, really showcase it with the header. The sizing is 1500 pixels by 500. So that's a, that's a pretty big image. But the first thing you want to do is look at your profile image, look at your header image. Once you've got that done, then next up, you got to work on your bio. And that's where I see people fail time and time again. You have 160 characters. You don't want to have a one-liner that's cutesy because that's not going to help you. Uh, I worked with an artist, uh, a musician years ago. And when I first looked at her Twitter profile, it all it said was rock singa, S-I-N-G-A-H. Like she's trying to be funny and cute. <laughs> and I looked at this. I said, no, 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 no. We can't do this. You know, you're an amazing rock singer. We got to show that off and 160 characters. So I had to come up with something that was awesome and compelling. And it's like you flip a switch. It's like going from night to day. And all of a sudden, people see the lights are on and they gravitate to you. So these are really, really important elements. And when you do this, then you can go out there and you're going to draw people in because they're going to look at your bio and and they're going to be interested in what you're doing. And one thing I want to point out that I notice a lot of people don't realize you can do is that on your bio, you can put a link to, to anything you want in there because you have a place for your .com when you're setting it up and you, you should always have your main .com. You know, like for instance, mine is madelinesclar.com. But in my bio, I have a link to my 
Twitter Smarter Podcast over at iTunes, I, I think like, what's the most important thing? Where do I want to send people right now? So if I had your attention, if I could pick one place to send them to other than my regular.com, where else would I want to send them? And it would be my podcast. So I have a link for that in the bio. And so little things like that can really boost your presence, help people get to wherever you want to send them to. So I think it's really important. And then you go onto Twitter chats, connect with people, and they're going to look at your bio and go, wow, this is somebody I need to know. That's a really great that's just, there's so much in there. Like I'm now, I pulled up my Twitter profile and I was like, I wonder what Madeline would think. <laughs> but some of the, I've got some of the things going on and, uh, you know, we'll see what I need to hone on. But I think, you know, something that I, I like when people identify what they do and kind of who they are in that specific way. But I do like when they have that one little nugget of something that's interesting. And so, for example, on mine, my last sentence, I have a I have a link within my little profile in addition to the dot com. So I'm doing that right. Um, but at the end, I say love sarcasm, coffee and the Oxford comma. Now the Oxford comma is like a totally nerdy writer thing. It's when you have that, you know, elements in a series, it's when you have a comma before the last word that comes before the and totally nerdy. And the funny thing is that that is like the most commented on thing when people come and see my profile, like even the very first Twitter Smarter uh, Twitter chat that I went to, I had like three different people comment specifically on that part of my profile. And so it's really weird, like those little idiosyncrasies can actually be, as long as that's not the only thing you have in there or like the biggest thing, like if you take up all your space, but that one thing has brought more remarks than anything else in my profile at all, which is kind of interesting. I love that. And I think it is very interesting. And it shows that you 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 know hit it right on you know the nail perfectly for people like you you've got something in there that get gets people to con- want to connect and like really get to know you because it's like something you know you guys have in common like they're like they get it you know and that's what's missing was i mean you know now that we're talking about this you and all the listeners here you guys are going to be paying way more attention to profiles now right Absolutely. and you're going to you're going to totally see who's nailed it and who has failed. And, you know, yours is so good. And it was good about yours also is that you're putting some personal things in there. You've got, you know, love, sarcasm, coffee and the Oxford comma. Right. And, and that's great. And I think it's good to have the business and, and something about you now with the 160 characters, of course, we're very limited. Yes. And so in my case, I just decided to be all business. And I've had people comment to me about that and like, well, Madeline, you don't have anything personal about you in your bio. Well, I was trying to put what was most important. I don't even have all the things about my business yeah. in my bio. You know, I, there's like 10 other things I could put in there related to me in business. So I went that route. The beauty of this, and this is what I tell everybody, is you make the rules. There's nobody telling you this is, these are the rules. This is the only way to do it. That's what I love about social media, especially with Twitter. We make our own rules. So do it how you see fit, but try to follow these very generic guidelines I'm giving out, you know, 160 characters, utilize all of it. You can put one or two hashtags in, put a link in there, you know, think about what's most important. Don't do a bunch of hashtags. You know, it seems to be a trend all of a sudden. Have you noticed that where people are putting in like all these hashtags in their bio? I'm like, wait a minute, what's the purpose? I think they don't really understand what, you know, how hashtags work because it's not really helping them. Yeah. So so should you have any hashtags in your bio or just steer clear and use those in your tweets? One or two is okay. Like in my, in my Twitter bio, I have one because of my, tw- you know, I use Twitter, the hashtag Twitter smarter for so many things. I use it for my online training yeah. courses, for my Twitter chat, for my podcast. It's kind of your brand. So like you It really have is. Have I, it. I, I, exactly. You, you, you said it exactly right. I branded it. The thing is, I don't want people to think, oh, I'm going to go run out and go get a hashtag and brand it. Hashtags you cannot own. This is just part of yep. Twitter. So if you're going to stay claim to a hashtag, go research it and make sure no one else is using it at all. If, if people are using it, they're going to walk on it over you. And this is just the way there's nothing you can do about it. So 
I, I wanted to stake claim to this and I wanted to find one that nobody else was using that I could brand. It's worked very, very well for me. I've branded this for like the last three years. I've done great with it. And so I incorporated it into my Twitter profile. So in the bio. So, you know, if you can, if something works for you, one way that I, I like to tell my clients to do is if there's a word that describes your business that you want to really spotlight because, you know, we can't bold anything. We can't put anything in italics. It's just plain text. So putting in a hashtag is cut to me. It's like bolding something. Yeah. So I've, I've, made changes in my bio, you know, over the years. And at one point, about a year ago, when I was doing this pivot from music business to gearing more for entrepreneurs and business owners and social media marketers and managers, is I use the hashtag entrepreneurs because I wanted people to know like, hey, I work with entrepreneurs. And so I hashtagged it solely to make it pop in the bio. Because because when you look at a bio, what's going to pop is anything that's a link and that would be a hashtag or a URL to a web page. So, you know, you'll start noticing now as you're starting to look at other bios, you'll go, wow, when I look at Madeline's Twitter smarter just pops out because it's a hashtag. Well, and I think, you know, that's the really important thing is, is figuring out what's going to make yours pop. And maybe it's a hashtag, maybe it's your link, maybe it's, you know, that one personal detail you add at the end. Like you said, there's no rules, you make the rules. And I think the profiles are really good place place to get practice for Twitter. So you have 140 characters for now. Um, and your bio, you have like, what is it, 160, you said? Yes, 160. So, you know, you the challenge with your bio and the challenge with every tweet is getting, you know, what what it is you want to communicate across in that tiny space, which I love that challenge. I think it's amazing. And I always like to say, I feel like Hemingway would have loved Twitter because it's just so concise. Although, I feel like he wouldn't have used it. But if he were alive today, like <laughs> <laughs> he may not use it, but he would have loved sort of this idea of being concise. Um, but, you know, the profile, you have to you have to choose. You have to pick and choose. And each tweet, too, like rarely do I compose a tweet that I don't have to edit for length. And, and not just because of the 140 characters, but, you know, if you're using something like Buffer or Hootsuite, you have to leave more characters for people to be able to retweet. And, you know, if they're doing it within that platform so that it'll include – you know, your handle and everything. And so I try to leave 24 characters in every tweet. And so I'm using less than 140. And it's insane. So but it really does. It's a great editor, it makes you work harder for it. And the profile is a great place. I wanted to point out something really funny. That's you just reminded me of it talking about how you can't uh, trademark or own a hashtag. And right here in Houston, there's a giant billboard that I drive by a lot off I 10. And it says it's a Lexus dealership. And they say, love our Lexus. And then they have the hashtag LOL. And I was like, okay, (laughs) somebody should get fired. Like, what are you thinking? And so if you go, I mean, no one, everyone's using the LOL hashtag. No one is using it to love our Lexus. Like that's, I don't even understand who, I mean, it's like a giant billboard. They paid good money for it. And I don't, there's nothing related to Lexus using the LOL hashtag. So it just, you know, it it does show you've got to be, smart about like the choices you make, whether it's a hashtag or something else, you're always representing your brand. You're always communicating something. Are you communicating what you want to communicate? And on Twitter, I think that's so important because you don't have any room. So right. yeah, I love that about it. But um, yeah, it does. It does sometimes create funny, funny moments like like that where you see brands misusing or using the wrong kind of hashtag. And then there are I love those like those big um lists of like Twitter fails or people using the wrong words. And there's actually, yes. there's a whole uh, profile, there's a user and oh, what is it? A uh, sneak peek. And what that person does is they go around because if you're getting a sneak peek at something, it's P-E-E-K. But often, very often people spell it P-E-E. AK, which is like a mountain peak. And so I know about this profile because once I misspelled it and that person just sits around and monitors all the people misusing it and then tweets at you and says that you oh, misused it. Funny. Okay. It's, and it's a pretty funny profile. So there, anyway, there's just, you got to be careful what you're communicating and making sure. I mean, that's a fine mistake to make. There's some mistakes that are terrifying. So <laughs> be intentional with that tiny space you have. So Talking about being intentional and managing everything, how do you manage your time and handle Twitter effectively? Do you have certain tools that you would recommend for people? And how do you just kind of get all that done? Right. And I do get asked that a lot because it is 
more and more challenging as you build your followers. You get so many people contacting you. Um, when I go to my notifications, it's crazy. There's at any, any given time, there's just tons of things to look at. And I like to connect with everybody. I don't want to leave, you know, somebody reaches out to me and ask a question, or even if they say hi, I want to reach back over to them and say hi back. And so it is challenging. Um, I use a variety of things. I actually teach this in, in my courses. So what I do, I have like a little method. And what I want to say is that you got to find what works for you. What works for me may not work for you. So what I do is I use twitter.com. I also use Hootsuite. Hootsuite I like to use for, for the listening. And a lot of my colleagues say they do the same thing. So it's more for the listening because I have the columns with my various lists. Twitter lists are very, very important and can help you stay very organized. So I have various lists. So an example would be I have one for Houston social media people and I have one for just the top social media. And um, one list that I absolutely love that I put together is for all the people I interview for my Twitter Smarter podcast. So every time I interview someone, as soon as it's done, I add them to that list. So I've built up, I think I have like 35 people in there that I've interviewed now. So that's a nice way to let people, you know, come and, and use it but also I use it for myself. So that's a list I like to look at because I'll see articles and information that I can then go put into my buffer stream for scheduling. So it'll go out later. So, so I use buffer. I also use tweet jukebox, which I absolutely love tweetjukebox.com. Have you used that one? No, Krista? I haven't, but I just listened to your interview and I forgot the founder's name, but I just listened to your interview about, about it and it was really fascinating to me. So I have not tried it yet. Yeah, that was Tim Fargo, the CEO. And what I love about his story is that he, the, the tweet jukebox that, that we're all able to sign up and use, he first had it designed and developed for his own personal use because he felt like there was something missing. And so he had a developer put it together for him and it was so good. He said, you know what, I'm going to make this available to the public. And it, it was free for about a year. Now he has um, a free version and a paid version. And it helps me tremendously. Highly recommend it because what's great about it, he, he has different things you can do with it. But the main thing and the way I use it is, is basically a set it and forget it type of scheduling. So for instance, I have really good articles on my blog that are what I call evergreen, meaning that is something that would still be useful information three months from now, six months from now, a year from now. And I tell this to my clients when I'm working with them and we're trying to figure out like, do they have some evergreen content? I'll say, is this something that you could tweet back out three months from now or six months from now? And if the answer is yes, then go set it up and put it in tweet jukebox because here's what happens is that let's say you've got 25 awesome articles in your blog that you wrote. You go and put them all in there just as regular tweets and you can put an image and, and the link. And so you go put them all in there as individual tweets and then you set the schedule. So you could say, okay, out of all these tweets, let's have one go out every day, every four hours. And you just set up the schedule to your own specifications and then you turn it on and it just goes. So it will just keep pushing this out and with my blog as an example, I have basically several times a day, one of my blog posts will go out and it'll do them all. And then when it's done, it'll start over. And so it just keeps going. And so it, here's the thing, because some people look at this and go, well, wait a minute, why are you doing that? It's like you're gaming the system. It's like, no, 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 no. I could do this manually, but that's time consuming. It's something I want to do. So why don't I automate it? Because the software is there to do it. There's a platform where I can put in all the information, hit go. And now there's one less thing for me to do for scheduling. And that frees me up to have more time to go and connect with people on Twitter. That's such so, a great point. I love yes. that. Yeah. Engaging in real time and then setting up some scheduling 
that you don't have to be there for because you've already written the post. Like, why would you need to like, (laughs) why would you need to do that manually when you don't have to? So I love that. Exactly. And so I love that he has a, a free version that everybody could use because it allows you to use everything in the platform. You just limited with um, how many would I, you know, he calls them jukeboxes. I just think of them as folders. So you could have two folders of this and you could have as much in each one. So, I mean, you can just have up to thousands of tweets in each one. So I wanted to go beyond that because I have mine like kind of broken down, like ones for my blog posts, ones are for like more of my promotional type that I wanted to separate because I don't want things promoting me to go out that much. So maybe once a day or twice a day. So I really wanted to limit that. So I wanted its own jukebox for that. And so there's so much you can do with it once you get in there and you start playing around with it. So I highly recommend it. It is such a great time saver for me. So that's been uh, one I really like. There's another one out there called Social Quant. Have you heard of that one? I have. I have. I looked at it, but I don't think I'm. Well, I know I'm not using it, but I don't know that I even like tried it out, but I definitely checked it out. Well, they're getting a lot of publicity. A lot of people are taking notice of them and they do have a 14 day free trial. If anyone is interested in trying it out, I have um, a special link for it that I can give to you. And the beauty is if that, if you, you try it and you like it, if you do it from my, I don't get paid. I mean, this is not like, you know, there's not no money involved, but if you use it off of my link, then they're going to give you a special offer because they love me. And so I've, I've interviewed uh, Mike Koala, the CEO for my podcast. That episode is not out yet, but uh, great people over there. But the beauty of this is that uh, if you decide to stick with it, you'll get half off if you if you do it through my link. And so let me, is it okay if I share that? Yeah, link? absolutely. I'll put it in the okay. show notes too, but just say it now for people yeah, who are I'm listening. Yeah, I'm going to say, okay, so the link, I made it a bit.ly link. So if you go to bit.ly, so B-I-T dot L-Y slash free quant. I did a really good easy awesome. one. Awesome, yeah. So the did. word free, F-R-E-E, and then quant, Q-U-A-N-T. So free quant, bit.ly, B-I-T dot L-Y slash free quant. So if you go there, it'll say, oh, friends of Madeline Sklar. And I totally do the, the free trial because, you know, you don't have to put a credit card. You don't have to do anything, um, but just try it. And here's what I love. So let me explain a little bit about this because here, here's what I like about it. It's another platform where it's something you do manually but why not let them do it for you? But here's the thing. A lot of people look at this and they go, well, wait a minute, aren't you buying followers? And like, no, it kind of looks like it's that, but it's not. What you're doing is you're letting their system and their algorithms go out and find people to follow, people that you would follow yourself. You give them a list, a list of keywords. So for me, it's like social media, online marketing, podcast, podcasting, also some of the top social media people. Also, my top uh, producing keyword is LinkedIn, which I thought is really interesting. So you give them really, really good keywords and you give them about 20. 20 is a good number I found. And you let the thing just run and you can go in and see what's performing. All my clients that have used this have gotten great results. So again, it goes back to this is something you would do anyway. Well, you know what? Actually, I do come across a few people that don't like to follow people. I actually had somebody on my blab last week that said, I don't go out and, and follow people. But I understand that if I don't follow people, people usually don't follow me. And I'm like, that is correct. So if you <laughs> want to connect with people yeah. and get more followers, which we all want, you got to go and follow people. You know, it's just the way it works on Twitter. And you could always unfollow people that are not connecting back if you, you know, you give them a little bit of time. And if they're just, you know, you could always do that. Um, but I have found that using social quant has boosted my Twitter dramatically. So I started using them in, in August of last year. So it hasn't really been that long. And I've gotten like over 9,000 new followers. Wow, that's pretty incredible. And that's so like five months. I like that because it's not like you're saying like everybody we all know not to buy followers anywhere. I, I said recently in a Facebook group, it's kind of like, 
um, so I was talking about Instagram and how there's people with terrible profiles and all these followers. And I was like, well, I know they're buying them. And it was like, for me, it was kind of like drugs. Like I know people do drugs and they buy them somewhere. I don't know where they buy them, but I <laughs> know that it happens and I know that I'm not going to do it. So um, the same thing with like buying followers, but that's not what that is because I know I've spent, like, I kind of make it my mission when we're watching Netflix or doing whatever to, you know, do that kind of work where I don't have to be fully engaged. So, like, I'll go in and, yeah, like you're saying, but I'll do it manually, like, search for keywords, search for people that have certain things in their bio, and then find followers or go to people that I really love, see who they follow, see who follows them, and, and you know, look through the profiles. But even, like, doing that while you're kind of watching a movie or kind of, like, you know, you're not fully engaged, that still takes a lot of time. And, you know, I would love to have a system like that. So I'm definitely going to check out Social Quant and also tweet Jukebox because I have I have a system. It's like a plug in. I forget what it's called now, but I don't love it. And it shares um, my old post, but it it doesn't share the image. And, you know, if it has a person, if it's an interview, like one of my podcast interviews, it doesn't tag the person. So I'm doing all the sharing about them, but it's not tagging them to let them know. Um, and I know some people use other, you know, there's so many social media tools. Some people use Edgar, but there's a few people that I know that use Edgar. And I don't know how that's set up exactly. I know that's another paid, um, but it's kind of, ex- I mean, it's like 50 a month. It's expensive. It's but very Edgar, expensive. Yeah. Edgar, is, from from my understanding, what I've looked at with Edgar is the same thing as Tweet Jukebox. So Tweet Jukebox is you can do the free version. And if you're doing paid like me, I'm paying $12.99 a month. That's a lot less than $50. Well, I want to ask you, I want to end the interview. I always like to ask what is inspiring people this week because we're all so different and have these different interests. So what is inspiring you this week? Gosh, you know, I get inspired by so many different things at any given time. Um, so it's a hard question. Um, you know, I'm really inspired. You know, when you talked about at the beginning of this podcast, our, our Houston social media community, I'm so inspired by that. And, you know, very recently, um, some of us have kind of banded together and you've been included in some of these uh, these tweets and we've kind of moved it over to direct messages. And I love how we're, we're always trying to make things happen. I It was just announced uh, a few days ago that I'm going to be the opening keynote speaker at the Houston Social Media Day in June. Which later I'm so this excited year. about. Thank you. I am so thrilled. I was a speaker last year. I, I you were as well, um, right? You were. No, you were I the- spoke at Houston Social Media Breakfast, but I did not. I was not able to go to the Houston Social Media Day last year. But I should. I'm hoping to be there this year. So okay, I'm going to make that okay. happen. Okay, I was probably yeah. I knew how you were at something. So I that's what's inspiring me is that we we got this. You know, we are the fourth largest city in the country. We're about to be number three, which is amazing. We have a great community of people here and I just keep getting inspired by them constantly, all these great people that we have here. And it just, I love it. Yeah. I think it's so much fun. And I, like you said too, it's, it's neat to have like the local community because for me, you know, the first time I went to Houston social media breakfast, I went into this room and I was like, oh my gosh, because I'm not really like what you would call a professional. <laughs> you know, like I didn't work in the business world. I don't think they would have me. And everybody, um, you know, seemed really polished and they have these fancy social media jobs. But then you sit down and start talking to people and it doesn't really matter. It doesn't really matter. You know, some of the people that I talk to, they're like, yeah, well, this is my job, but here's my passion, you know, and I'm here because of my passion and also my job, you know, but there's just such a diversity. There's so many different ways to use social media and it is really neat to connect actually in person and to sit down and see people face to face that you meet. And, um, you know, I think the first time I actually met a person online or met a person in real life that I met first online, I was with my mom taking a road trip. And I was like, so P.S. We're stopping in Atlanta to meet a friend that I met on a blog. She was like, what? (laughs) That doesn't sound safe. And, you know, 10 years ago, that wouldn't have been safe. But I feel like the, you know, social media has had and it still it could not be. So warning, you know, do your research and all that. I'm not <laughs> advocating going and meeting crazy people online. But, um, you know, I feel like the world today, social media has helped make it small. And I love that. I love that you can connect with people who are far and also people who are near. And maybe you connect first on Twitter like we did and then actually meet in real life, which is super cool. So that that's a great thing to be inspired by is uh, 
local people and, you know, the people you're connecting with. So I'm glad that you and I connected. So thank you so much for coming on the podcast and taking this time to talk to me and my audience. We really appreciate it, Madeline. Thank you so much for inviting me. It's been an honor. And I hope everyone here listening um, was able to take away some some great information. And I want everybody to, to, you know, put it to use because one of the things I always say at the end of, you know, whatever it is I'm speaking, whether it's uh, with my courses, my training, or somebody interviewing me like yourself, is that I can sit here and share information all day long. It's what I do, but you've got to go take action. It just doesn't do any good unless you do something with it. So I hope everyone here will, will take this at a, as a call to action. And of all these things you learned today, pick at least one, hopefully you'll do everything, but pick one that really resonates with you and go act on it. And I would love for you to tweet and let us know how that's working out. Yeah. And I will leave links to all of your information in the show notes. But if you are in a hurry and you're like, no, I can't wait, I'm not going to click through a blog, just go on Twitter and do the hashtag Twitter smarter and you will find Madeline right there. (laughs) That's so true. (laughs) Well, thanks again. And I will talk to you and actually see you very soon. Okay, so I want to know what the one big takeaway, the actionable thing is that you are going to go action that you're going to go and do right now. Right now. I mean, now I mean, press pause, go do something. And then I want you to tweet at me and Madeline. So Madeline is just her name, M-A-D-A-L-Y-N-S-K-L-A-R. So at Madeline Sklar, and I'm at Kiki Mojo. And you can use the hashtag Twitter smarter if you want to. That's a great way to get her attention. And just let us know what are you going to apply from hearing some of these great actionable things, the tools that Madeline uses, which is really, really helpful. I'm still playing with some of them. I tried social quant and I'm debating about continuing with that. And I've signed up for tweet jukebox. So I want to know what you guys are going to do. My actionable thing is that I am going to program in some evergreen content to be shared every week because I do use revival post, which goes and tweets kind of automatically will, you know, pull blog posts from both of my blogs and tweet them out. But I don't have anything tweeting out sort of my you know, own your list email course or my free email course, or, you know, even just a sign up to or a link to my landing page for my email list. And all those are really important things that need to be going out every week. And if I don't remember them, they don't go out. So my one actionable thing is scheduling those things so that you guys will see them weekly on Twitter. Okay, so final reminder, sign up for the foundation series, create if writing.com slash foundation series. And also a big thank you, as always, to Jasmine Commerce for the lovely, lovely music that you hear playing at the beginning and the end of the show. You can find her at jasminecommercemusic.com. Thank you so much for listening, for taking in these tips about Twitter, and I hope you have an inspired week. Ah.